Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 is where we left off last week. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Last week, we looked at the four blessings that we have as a result of being justified and being in Christ. We saw that we have peace with God, we have access, we have we, this grace wherein we stand, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And we looked at the journey that we take as Christians from the moment that we're saved. Something happens to us that is truly remarkable. You know, we looked at how that you are crucified with Christ, that you were buried with Christ, or you died with Christ, you were buried with Christ, and laying there in the grave, you were quickened with Christ, you were raised with Christ, and then you were made to sit in heavenly places in Christ, and God looks at that as though it's something that is already done, it's over with, it's complete. The only thing that needs to happen is the realization for us when it materializes and we actually experience it. But in the reckoning of God, it's all done. It's all finished. Ye are complete in Christ. Nothing else needs to happen for you to ensure your salvation. I was in the home of some people this past week. And it was two sisters and one brother. They all go to the same church. And, you know, after we got done with all of our official things that I was there for and all the papers were signed and all the stuff was put away, you know, I brought up the gospel. And I told them, you know, I, you know, I pastor a little church and we preach the gospel. And I asked them where they went and all this. The final analysis of their view of the gospel, and this is what one of the sisters do, told me. She said, well, if you ain't living right, you're not going to heaven anyway. You know. Well, unfortunately, I did not have time to sit there and, you know, take all of their doctrines and put them in the right order. I didn't have time to do that, which often happens in situations like that. But, you know... Could you imagine after this journey that you have taken to the place where you are seated with Christ in heavenly places that God could ever take that away from you after you have received it? The only way that a person could ever come to the conclusion that they could lose what they have in Christ is because they don't know what they have in Christ. They don't know God. They don't understand what kind of an eternal God we serve who cannot do things on temporary basis? They don't understand that. And they don't see that. And they're not being taught that. It's absolute, it's just as impossible for you to be taken out of Christ as it is to remove the fingerprint from your hand. Because in the same way that you are in Christ, you're in the same, you're in Christ in the same way that your fingerprint is on your hand. They're part of it. It's part of it. You're part of it. You're in there. You cannot separate your fingerprint from your hand. I know some people in the mafia have used acid to try to burn their fingerprints off, but that's, that's different. They're trying to do it. But realistically, your hand and your fingerprints are one. They're two separate things, but they're one. Well, guess what? You cannot be separated from the love of Christ either, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. The love of God towards you was demonstrated in Jesus Christ. It's in Christ, and that's where you are. 
God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's, that's how, he did it, how he demonstrated it. So here you are. You are in Christ, and nothing can separate you from that. Have you ever stuck your tongue on an ice-cold pole in the middle of winter? I'll never forget when I was a young boy, my family and I, we went to this place in Canada, which was an experimental town that they were building way up in the north of Canada, as far north as you can go in Canada. We flew there in a little airplane to visit some of our cousins that were there. And the place was called Gagnonville. It no longer exists. It's been raised. But in those days, my uncle was part of an administrator of a hospital, and he was up there to take care of that aspect of, the, of that little society that they were building up there. Well, I'll never forget we went there, and it was cold. Now, that was cold. And don't you know, my little cousin, his name's Gaeta, they got those swings outside, ice cold steel, right? And I said to him, you should never put your tongue on this. He said, why not? I said, because you're not supposed to do that. He goes, oh, yeah? Gah! Well, I'll never forget that. He could not remove his tongue. His tongue was stuck to the pole, and nothing could separate his tongue from that pole. <laughs> and that's how you are in Christ. You are stuck so that nothing can separate you from that. I remember I ran inside, got my mother, and, uh, and who else, whoever else came out, and they saw him. He was crying. I mean, he was just, because he could not remove his tongue. And they came out with water cold water and they poured it and eventually got his tongue off but I'll never forget that because and I was thinking of that when I was preparing this because see unlike his tongue which eventually was separated you can never be separated never nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in which was demonstrated to us in Jesus Christ. So in verses 1 and 2 of Romans chapter 5, introduce you to the unending perpetual relationship that you have with God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Introduces you to your identity, who you are now in Christ. A very good place to be. Very safe place to be. So Paul did an incredible job in presenting this concept of what we have in Christ in the first two verses of Romans chapter 5. After that is understood, after you understand your position, who you are, the eternal value of it, after you understand that, Paul immediately begins to introduce us to a subject that you would not think that he would begin talking about it so soon after taking us out into eternity in what we have in Christ. But notice the last words of verse 2, that we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And remember we said that that's the end of the journey. Not only will you see the glory of God, but you will be a partaker in the glory of God, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be, revealed, uh, to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. So we're going to partake and see the glory of God. That's the end of the journey. You would think that with that grand image, that grand picture in Paul's mind, that he would continue along those lines. But he doesn't. Because belonging to God in this world has consequences. There are heartaches. There's pain. There are problems associated with belonging to God. So the very first thing that Paul is going to talk to you about 
after you have been justified by faith, notice what he says in verse 3. And not only so. We don't just glory in, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. He introduces us to a subject that seems so contrary, so different, that, from, that, that you wouldn't expect it because there you are seated with Christ in heavenly places. And all of a sudden, he takes you from there and he brings you here to the most important doctrine in the Christian life. The word tribulation is found 22 times in your King James Bible. The first time tribulation is mentioned, and this is fascinating. This is very interesting if you have never seen this. The first time the word tribulation is found is Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 30. And notice what the verse says. When thou art in tribulation and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days. Now, does God know when the tribulation is going to happen to Israel? When? In the latter days. After the dispensation of grace. That was a secret hidden God. He knew this was coming. But in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God and shalt be obedient to his voice. The latter days. So that the first mention of the word tribulation has to do with the tribulation that Israel will go through in the latter days. This is different than the tribulation Paul is referring to in Romans 5.3. The tribulation Paul is referring to, he's not talking about that we're going through the tribulation period. Paul is talking about the tribulations of life that happen as a consequence of belonging to God. That's what Paul is referring to. And this is so contrary to what you hear from the, the TV evangelists and the radio reverends and the preachers on YouTube, if what you hear from them were true, that you'd be the happiest person in the world, you'd be prospering, you'd be living in a mansion, you'd be driving your car, you listen to the smiling Joel Osteen and this is your time, brother. This is your best life. Your life now and God's timing have finally come together in the crossroads of time, and this is where your blessings are coming. And then he quotes the first half of Deuteronomy 28. He forgets the second half is there. But he does like the first half. But that's not what the Bible teaches. See, the Bible teaches that immediately after you're saved, justified, crucified, died, buried, quickened, raised, seated with Christ in heavenly places, immediately when that happens, the next thing on the scene is tribulations. And there are basically three different kinds of tribulation that a Christian will experience in this life. The first one is there's personal tribulation that you bring upon yourself by some of the decisions that you make or some of the decisions that we all make, okay? Then there's the tribulation of suffering, pain, heartache, death, things that come upon us that happen to all people, really. Saved and unsaved. They ex you know, we, everybody goes through some form of pain and affliction and suffering in this present world. Getting sick, people dying, children dying, uncles dying, husbands and wives dying, parents dying. Something that we're all familiar, okay? 
But then there's the tribulation that comes to us because we are in Christ. Because we belong to God. And because we share the gospel in this world. That's the tribulation that Paul is referring to here. He's referring to the tribulation that is associated with Christ and knows and, and he knows what he's speaking of in this department. Paul is very familiar with this kind of tribulation. And this is a subject, it's very dear to my heart. Because, you know, the brethren, my brethren who preach the word of God rightly divided, those of you who share the gospel with those around you, know about this kind of tribulation. And know about this kind of rejection and being lied about and stories being told about you and, you know, uh, straw, straw men being built up, if you know what I mean by that. I don't have time to explain that, but. And so those who are involved in this gospel this gospel of grace, not the gospel of the kingdom, this gospel of grace will be familiar with this kind of tribulation. Not in the proportion that Paul is familiar with it. Paul had a knowledge of this that transcended anything that any of us in this room or watching will ever, ever be able to experience. Now, I've shared these verses with you before, maybe a year ago, maybe two years ago. But there are just some things that are worth repeating. This is one of those that is worth repeating. Many years after Paul wrote the book of Romans, he wrote the book of Colossians. And Paul said something about tribulation, about suffering, and in Colossians, he actually gives a definition to what he says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 2. And he puts a depth of understanding to tribulations and sufferings because he identifies them and he connects them with a person, with someone. Uh, and this is what he said, Colossians 1.24 who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. So what I want to do today is look at tribulations and sufferings in the light of this verse. And, you know, like I said before, this is, I mean, I spoke about, I spoke about these things to you before. So this will not be new to some of you, but it will be new to others. But God teaches us something about the nature of repeating things like this through nature. I want to explain that. You know, the rain comes down from the sky. It always falls on the same trees, the same grass, the same flowers. And although the, the rain is the same every time, Every time it rains, something new happens. New flowers, new buds, new fruits, new growth. And that's how it is with the Word of God. You know, we read in Isaiah 55, 10 and 11, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returns not thither, but watereth the earth, and makes it to bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be. How's that? As the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and it gives bread to the eater, seed to the sower, so shall my word be. In other words, every time the word of God goes out, although it's something you heard a year ago or two years ago, when you hear it this time, it will produce something entirely different in you. Just like the rain goes down into the earth and is brought, brought up into the trees and the flowers and, and the grass, 
they appreciate it every time. And that's how the Christian life is. You know, because as we go through the scriptures, as we go through the word of God, there are, there are so many things that are repeated from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 20, 22 that there are so many things that are repeated. But there's a reason for that. You know, like Paul said, for me to say the same things unto you again is not grievous, but for you it is safe. So I say, I say that because these message, this message, I've presented this before. But now that you're growing in Christ and your understanding is growing and you're gaining ground, let this new rain fall on the roots of your Christian life in a new understanding. Amen? So I want you to notice in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, notice those, the first two words for a moment. Who now, Paul says. Who now. 35 years after his Damascus Road experience, after a life of beatings with rods, being stoned, being shipwrecked, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of the heathen, in perils of his own countrymen, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils amongst false brethren, in sufferings often, in painfulness, after a life of suffering, of being troubled on every side, being perplexed, being persecuted, cast down, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, after Alexander the coppersmith had did him much evil, after being slanderously reported, after suffering as an evildoer, after all they which be in Asia have turned away from me, and now as he's writing the book of Colossians, sitting in a Roman prison, chained to a Roman soldier, he writes, who now, 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 as he writes that, who now, in the middle of, of all of this pain and anguish and affliction and suffering and heartache and discouragement and disappointments from other Christians who have left him and forsaken him, he says, who now? And what's he doing? Who now rejoice in my sufferings. Wow. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And, and here's the amazing thing. When Paul was commissioned to go forth, notice with me that he knew what the future held for him. In Acts 9.13, then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of, of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name, but the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Boy, I mean, he hasn't even told Paul yet. He's telling Ananias, I'm going to, be, I'm going to show him the things that he must suffer for my name's sake. You know, and then Paul spent time with the risen Lord learning about the suffering that he was going to endure and his destiny as a preacher of the gospel. But notice this. He did not suffer for himself. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, for you. He had a reason. It was for you. It was for the body of Christ, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you 
and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ. Now when Paul speaks of the afflictions of Christ, what is he referring to? And this is what we're going to look at today. Because, now there's a verse in Hebrews 12. Don't turn there. I'm going to put it up here. It explains this. It explains what the afflictions of Christ were. Notice this verse in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. For consider him, that's Jesus Christ, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. So Jesus Christ endured the contradiction of sinners against himself. These sinners in Hebrews chapter 12 comprise two groups of people. The first group of sinners against him was the sinners from the world. You'll notice Matthew 10, 22 told his disciples, you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Of course, that's the end of the tribulation period. But here is a biblical principle that is true of all of God's people at all time. Time past, but now, and ages to come. God's people have always been hated by the world. Always. You are the butt of more jokes than Carter has pills. But, right? notice John 15, 18. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. So, Jesus Christ was first hated by the world. That's one group of, of enduring the contradiction of sinners against himself. The second group that he was hated by was the religious group, the religious crowd. In Matthew chapter 12, the religious world said he was a devil. In Matthew 21, they challenged his authority. Notice verse 23, and when he was coming to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? In Matthew chapter 22, they took counsel against him. Notice verse 15. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. In Luke chapter 4, uh, the first time that he read in the temple, they were, they were filled with wrath and wanted to kill him prematurely. Look, Luke 4, 28, and all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of a hill whereupon there was, their city was built that they might cast him down headlong. In Luke chapter 5, they called him a blasphemer. Notice verse 21. And the scribes and Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? In Luke 14, 1, And it came to pass, as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, they watched him. In Luke 16, 14, And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. The religious world has always hated Jesus Christ. Always. Not just the religions that you grew up in, who would rather have you focus on someone else for your redemption or for your access to God. Anything other than faith alone, in Christ alone, through his word alone. Anything other than that. Covetousness is 
one of the main motivating factors in Christian dumb as to why people reject the Word of God. And, and in Christianity, biblical Christianity, covetousness is why they reject the Word of God rightly divided. Because right division, they think, and rightfully so, will take away the, the tithe. What they don't understand, what they don't understand is this, that under the law, they had to give 10%. They had to grudgingly, at fear of death, at fear of being cursed. They had to do that. Under grace, you could give whatever you want. You could give 20%. You could give 30% if you wanted. The least you should give is 10%. That's what they did under the law. Seriously. I don't know where Christians today got the idea that they should do less than those people who were required to give under the law. Where would you get that idea? I sure didn't teach it to you. But you see, covetousness in religion is a sin, even in right division. Even in right division. So Jesus Christ was hated by the world, and he was hated by religion. So basically, he was hated of all men. And he endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. In Colossians chapter 1, we read that Paul filled up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ. Well, what does that mean? How did Paul do that? Well, if you want to follow, well, I'll, let me read this verse to you. 2 Timothy 3.10. It says, but thou, talking to Timothy, thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. Well, what kind of persecution did Paul have to endure to bring the gospel of the grace of God? What did he go through? Well, you'll notice here, there are three cities that are named, Antioch, Iconium, and at Lystra. So if you want to follow this journey, turn to Acts chapter 13 in your Bibles. Acts chapter 13. And let's follow Paul as he fills up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ. And before we begin looking at this, there's a verse I want to show you. Okay, I'm just going to bring it up here, Acts 26. Paul said, I, and I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. By the way, that title, Jesus of Nazareth, is only used in connection. You know, you hear preachers today, they talk about Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, hold it. The title, Jesus of Nazareth, is only and always exclusively used in the Jesus of Nazareth who was rejected. It's always his title as the rejected Savior. We no longer preach Jesus of Nazareth. But Paul, contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, the rejected one, you look it up, look up in your concordance. Every time you see Jesus of Nazareth, it's never in a good context. It's always as the rejected Messiah. Okay? That's important. That's important. Verse 10. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. I was like, yeah, kill them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compel them to blaspheme. Notice being and being exceedingly mad against them. 
I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Think of those words. Being exceedingly mad. Wow. Do you know that that was the ordinary posture of a Pharisee? <laughs> That's what a Pharisee was. He was always exceedingly mad. Why? They were under the law. And the expectations of the law just bore down on them. These were not happy people. Even today, they're not happy people. I'll never forget one day I was in South Florida, in Fort Lauderdale. And I walked into a bank, and there was a long line of people, okay? And I was a young Christian in those days, and those were the days when I thought that if you, like the, like the verse says, I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee. And this little Jewish lady came walking in the bank. And, and, I, and you could tell she was a Jewish lady because she just was like right out of the Old Testament. And she came in, right? And I saw, you know what, although there's a long, like, go ahead, man, get in front of me. You know, bless them, that bless them. Are cur That's what I thought, right? Do you know, like when I went, like, and she walked by, she kind of like shrugged her shoulder and got in front of me with this really nasty attitude. Like, you should let me go anyway. Something like that, right? But I'm just saying, when you're under the law and the expectations of the law bear down on you every day, no, you're not a happy camper. See, grace removes that. Grace removes that burden, right? Okay. So being exceedingly mad was the everyday posture of a Pharisee. That's the world Paul lived in. He understood. That's how he understood life. But now Paul has been apprehended by Jesus Christ. He's been arrested. And the one that he persecuted, the Lord Jesus Christ, he's now going to face him. He's now going to be with him and face the same wrath and anger from the Jews that he once held against other people. That's what we're going to see. He's going to face those who are exceedingly mad. So Acts chapter 13, notice verse 14. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. From verses 15 through 29, Paul is going to rehearse the, the, the history of Israel as you read down there. From verses 30 to 37, Paul is going to speak of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In verses 39 and 40, he's going to make a contrast and show the difference between the law and the work of the cross. And he says to them that by Jesus Christ, all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Verse 40 is a warning to, to those for rejecting the gospel. Notice verse 40. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers, and wonder, and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. In verse 42. The Gentiles waited for the Jews to leave, and they wanted Paul to preach to them the next week. Look at verse 42. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. And when that meeting was broken up, notice verse 43. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. This is the early days of Paul's ministry. 
So we know what Paul was preaching in his early days. He was preaching the gospel of the grace of God that Acts 20 verse 24 says was the, the ministry which the Lord Jesus Christ gave me. The gospel of the grace of God. Don't let anyone tell you or try to persuade you that Paul was not preaching the gospel of the grace of God. Because that's not true. You know, there's a, there's a whole segment in Christianity called the Acts 28 movement who believe that the, Paul didn't preach the gospel of grace until Acts 28 and that he went to the Jews first because he had a message exclusively for them so they could get saved. But here we just read about some Gentiles wanting Paul to preach to, the, to them, which he did, okay? And matter of fact, just look at Romans 11. Keep your finger there, but, okay, these Acts 28 people, I will tell you this, they have all sorts of reasons why Paul went to the Jew first. Because he went to every synagogue and he went first to the Jews. He even says that in Romans 1, to the Jew first, then to the Greek, then to the Gentiles, right? And they come up with all kinds of reasons why he went to the Jew first except the right reason. The right reason is found right here in Romans chapter 11. Notice verse 11, now I say then, have they stumbled at the cross, that the, the Jews rejecting Christ, have they stumbled at the cross that they should fall in Acts chapter 7? God forbid. But rather through their fall, Acts 7, stoning of Stephen, salvation is come unto the Gentiles. Why? For to provoke them to jealousy. Paul had a provoking ministry to provoke the Jews to jealousy because he was going to the Gentiles. And he went to the synagogues first and he preached to them this Jesus Christ who died, was buried, and was raised from the dead. Then this salvation was for all people. And there the Jews were going, no, it's not for all. The, the Gentiles are going to get their salvation through us, through the rise of Israel. Because every Jew knew Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, I will bless them that bless the curse them, and you shall be a blessing to all nations of the world. And they knew all about that. They knew Isaiah chapter 60, 61, 62. They knew that. Now the Gentiles are being preached to apart from the rise of Israel. They're being preached to as a result of the fall of Israel and that preaching by Paul to the Gentiles was to provoke them to jealousy. That's the reason Paul went to the synagogues first. That's why. Okay, so he persuades them very early in his ministry. He's persuading people to continue in the grace of God. So there it is right there in Acts chapter 13. And it's also in Acts chapter 11. One of my favorites, let's just look at that too, okay. In Acts chapter 11, right, the, the, the disciples are still in Jerusalem. They're in Jerusalem. Paul is out there. He's been preaching the gospel for years now. Years, the gospel of grace. Notice verse 21, Acts 11, 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. This is in Jerusalem. Then tidings, then tidings of these things came, oh no, no, I'm sorry, the twelve at Jerusalem are in verse 22. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church was at Jerusalem. Those, the church at Jerusalem are those that were there when the Holy Spirit fell. Okay, 14 years later, they're still in Jerusalem. They haven't moved because Luke chapter 24 said that go to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem and don't go anywhere until Jerusalem is saved. Well, Jerusalem wasn't saved yet, so they're still there. But they heard about what's going on out there with this Paul. They, they hear the tidings, right? And then tidings of these things came into the ears of the church, which is in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas. Who was Barnabas? He was a member of the little flock. He was a member of the church at Jerusalem, those who had embraced Jesus Christ as their Messiah not as the resurrected head of the body of Christ. They didn't even know about that yet. They didn't know about that. 
So they sent Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. In other words, go up to Antioch, find out what's going on, and come back. Go as far as Antioch, and you can just hear Peter saying, don't go one step beyond. Okay? Verse 23, who, Barnabas, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad. And exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord in this great gospel of grace. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost. Yeah, he was there at Pentecost. Better believe he was full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. Notice. Then Barnabas, then departed Barnabas to go back to Jerusalem and tell the twelve what he saw. Uh, then departed Barnabas. To, to seek Saul. Who is this man who has this gospel of grace? And this man who once belonged to the little flock is now traveling with Paul, preaching the gospel of the grace of God. And that's why I tell some of my preacher friends, here's somebody who was in the little flock who became a member of the body of Christ. And that's like, uh, well, no, that's what happened. It would have been no different then somebody who's a Catholic today or a Methodist or whatever or a, or a, a Buddhist or a Jehovah's or whatever hearing the gospel and going, wow, I believe that. They could have embraced the gospel of the grace of God when they heard it, although they had trusted Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Obviously, Barnabas did. Right there in black, black and white. So, there we are, Acts chapter 11 and Acts chapter 13, and Paul is preaching the gospel of grace, and people love it. People are embracing this gospel. All right? So, so far, so good. Now, this is the first city in 2 Timothy 3.11 that Paul tells Timothy that, Timothy, you fully knew the afflictions and the persecutions that came unto me at Antioch. So what happened at Antioch? Notice verse 44, Acts 13, 44. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Man, that's a great thing, right? You would think it was a great thing. Verse 45. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. They were filled with that was Paul's provoking ministry, to provoke them to jealousy. And that's exactly what happened. And spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, notice, contradicting and blaspheming. Paul was enduring the afflictions of Christ in the same way that Christ endured the contradiction of sinners against himself. Here Paul is, right here in Acts chapter 13, enduring the contradiction of sinners against himself. He's filling up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ. There it is. It's happening right before your eyes. Now keep this in mind because this is a principle that has existed from that day until today. You also endure the contradiction of sinners against Christ. You also are filling up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ. We all do that. If we share this gospel, that is. You know, it, comes with the, it comes with the territory, but you've got to be in the territory. Because if you're not in the territory, you have, you'll have no clue what I'm talking about. Religion has always hated this gospel of grace. You take away obedience to the law in any form, whether it's taking away the Ten Commandments that Moses gave, whether it's taking away Deuteronomy 28 where your TV preachers are parked, whether it's 
You take away Malachi 3.10. Whether you take away the four Gospels and say, well, yeah, there's great applications, but it's not written to you. Whether you take away the first chapters of the book of Acts with its cloven tongues of fire and its speaking in tongues where the Spirit of God gave them utterance. Whether you take away their signs and wonders and diverse miracles. When you remove these things from religion, and you take away that law from them. Those people who are accustomed to taking that and bringing it into the body of Christ. When you take those things away from them, those components that are of the law, you have some angry people looking at you. You have some upset people looking at you. You have the pharisaical community who are exceedingly mad against you that you would dare preach that salvation was a free gift, that you can't do anything to earn it, you don't deserve it, just believe and you'll be saved. They are exceedingly mad <laughs> against you. Amen? And not only do they hate the message, they hate the messenger. And if you happen to be the one with that message, they will hate you too. And they will lie about you. And if you haven't experienced that, it's coming. But regardless of the opposition to the message, and no matter how being filled with envy they were, notice verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold. <laughs> yeah, amen to that. When religion raises its ugly head against you, it's not time to cower. It's time to stand up and be bold and take your stand against it. And how did the Gentiles view Paul and Barnabas waxing bold? Verse 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. You know that your Acts 28 people will tell you that Paul did not preach to the Gentiles. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region, verse 49. Regardless of the opposition, they kept preaching. Persistence, perseverance, continuity. But religion is not happy with people who, who preach grace. So what do they do? Verse 50. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city, and raised persecution. They raised persecution. Think about that. They incited. They agitated the people. They incited a riot against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. Well, notice in verse 50 that they stirred up devout and honorable men and women. They stirred up, they stirred up those people that, that had all the trappings of religiosity that others would look to and look at them because they seemed to be people in the know. They were close with the religious leaders, with the elders, with the chief priests, devout and honorable men and women of the city. How, how honorable could they be if they're raising up persecution against Paul? So what did the Jews do to these people? They infected their minds. Infected their minds. They stirred them into a frenzy against Paul. That's what religion does against the message of God's grace. They get certain people in the church, gather them together, men of renown, 
women of renown who seem to know what they're talking about, and they stir them against Paul's message. They lie to them about Paul's message and even about Paul himself. And they tell stories. And what do they do with the messengers? Notice verse 50, and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. They not only removed them from their city, not only asked them to leave, they expelled them. You ever heard of somebody getting expelled from school? That's final. You know, you can be temporarily suspended, but when you're expelled, you're not coming back. Right? They brought them to the border of their territory and expelled them out of their coast, probably with threats of death if you come back with that message. Imagine if the, the local church where you left were able to have their way with you. They'd expel you for preaching this gospel of salvation by grace through faith alone. Put you on a plane to Siberia with a one-way ticket. That's what they do to you. See, because religion as we know it today has always hated the gospel of grace. You're going through the, the Hi Grace History Project now. You'll be hearing all about that, I'm sure. I haven't had a chance to even look at any of those, but you'll be hearing all about that. The Paulicians. Whew. There's a lot of bad things that have happened down through the centuries against the gospel of God's grace. Never has it been a, a pretty picture. But how did Paul and Barnabas respond? Look at verse 51. They shook off the dust off their feet against them and came to Iconium. Shaking off the dust. Joni, let me ask you a question. Did you put the time at quarter of, when, uh, at 11 when we started it, or did you put it at what time it was? That's when you started it? Okay. I can't believe an hour is gone already, but. Yeah, I know, but. I, I, I will keep going, but I have to stop. <laughs> uh, all right. So that's what happened at Antioch. Right, there's, there's three cities in all. The second place Paul mentions is Iconium, chapter 14, verse 1. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went back both together into the synagogue of the Jews and so spake, that a great multitude both of Jews and also of the Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles, notice, and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Same thing they did at Antioch. And these are not the same people. These are different people. They filled their minds with fear about what Paul was teaching. That's what they're going to do today. They get the deacons, they get the elders together with some prominent people in the church, and they start infecting their minds about you. When I left the church on the hill, that's what they did. Pastor got the deacons and the elders together. Rodney's out there, he's preaching a strange gospel. He's going to confuse you if you listen to this. And boy, all of a sudden, they're all like, like none of them know their Bible. You know, they don't know anything about their Bibles. So they believe this. But the pastor said, we've got to stay away from Rodney. That's what they did there. That's what they do now. That's why I said what, you're, what we're reading now, from that day till now, it's the same thing. What they did is what's happening. You know, they infect their minds, and then they walk away. Can you believe he says that the Gospels aren't for us today? He, he says, we're not supposed to preach out of anything in the Bible except Paul's epistles. Can you believe that? That's what they say. Of course, that's not what we do. That's what I meant by straw men. They'll build a straw man that isn't true, and then people attack that as though it was the real thing. That's not how it is, you know. And then that starts to spread like a cancer throughout the whole church. Don't listen to him. 
is going to confuse you. And their minds are evil affected against the gospel of grace. So they had trouble in Antioch. They had trouble in Iconium. And in chapter 14 and verse 5, they realize there's a conspiracy against them to stone them. They catch wind of it in verse 6. They were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and unto the region that lieth round about. So they go to Lystra. That's the third place Paul mentioned in 2 Timothy. And then notice verse 8, there, and there sat a man, there sat a certain man at Lystra. And here Paul heals a cripple. And as you go down the chapter, the people think the gods have come unto us. So Paul and Barnabas go in amongst them. They take their clothes off. They say, hey, we're just like you. We're not gods. And then while that's happening, while that's happening <clears throat> in Lystra, remember the two places, Antioch and Iconium. Those, okay. Well, it seems that the people are not just happy that they've expelled Paul and Barnabas out of their coasts. They got, like, buyer's remorse about that. So they decide to gather all, as many people as they can in Antioch and as many people as they can in Iconium, and they come down to Lystra. Notice verse 19. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium. All right, now that's two groups of people that come down. And they persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Now, you have to think about this. Because here's a crowd of angry, exceedingly mad Jews in Antioch. From Antioch to Iconium is 83 miles. From Iconium to Lystra is 25 miles. There, that's 108 miles that these people are going to walk with steam coming out of their ears, mad at Paul. Now look, you just picture any point from your house, 108 miles away, and start walking. That's a long walk. But these people, they are absolutely determined to get rid of this guy preaching the gospel of grace. I mean, they're just going to, they don't want him around. So when they arrive in Lystra, this mob, angry, they're probably murmuring under their breath for 108 miles. So they persuade the people and imagine the uproar that they created against Paul. I mean, these people are good at this. They're good at inciting and evil affecting people's minds. They know how to agitate. And, of course, they do it here to the point where they draw Paul and, Bar and they stone them. And you can imagine the hatred, the animosity against the gospel that would make people want to do that. And if you, you may not have ever thought about this, but I'm going to tell you, that the people who hate the pure gospel of God, if it were possible, they would do that to you too. If it were legal, they would do that to you too. You know, Richard Jordan one day was preaching and some guy threw him a, a firebomb right at, in the pulpit. That was many years ago. I think the guy's still in jail. For having done, he tried to kill him in the pulpit. People hate the gospel of grace. I mean, they hate it. Take away their works. Take away that feely good thing that I've done something. And people despise that. But did they kill him? Verse 20, how be it? As the disciples stood round about him, he rose up, came into the city. The next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. See, no wonder Paul tells Timothy, thou hast fully known my persecutions, afflictions, which came to me at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. Now, you would think after all that persecution that Paul would stay away from those cities, right? 1421. 
And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra, to Iconium, and Antioch. And you might ask yourself, why in the world would that man who was expelled, probably with the threat of death, say, I'm going back? Well, in Ephesians chapter 20, he, he's explaining to the elders at Ephesus, and now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Things are waiting for me in every city that I go. He knows what's happening. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. That was your apostle, folks. That's why he said, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ. For you, that's the reason. So I'm going to make this quick because, boy, we're really over. I don't think I've ever gone this long, but I, I want to just finish this real quick, okay? As we move forward, look at Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Paul's now in Thessalonica, and he goes to the synagogue. Like I said a while ago, he goes there first. He has a provoking ministry to Israel. He preaches in verse 5, notice some believe, but the Jews which believe not moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd bellow, uh, fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city in an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out of the people. So in verse 10, Paul and Barnabas leave, they go to Berea. Verse 11, the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica, that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily to see whether those things were so. Verse 12, Therefore, many of them believed also, but, verse 13, but when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. From Berea, from Thessalonica to Berea is 43 miles. These people got no problem walking all this distance to go get rid of this guy. They got no problem doing that. And you can go through the entirety of the book of Acts and see this continually happening to Paul that in every city these things abide him. Afflictions abide me, he said. The book of Acts has been called many things. It's been called uh, uh, the transition period. It's been called the, the Acts of the Holy Spirit. It's been called the Acts of the Apostles. It's called the bridge between or the book between. It's transitional, not doctrinal. It's the book that takes us from law to grace. It's been called all those things. But I'm telling you that the book of Acts is the book about how Paul filled up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ. What he would call... In the book of Philippians, notice, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, notice, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Paul considered the fellowship of Christ's sufferings something to be endeared and loved and appreciated. And the same things that Jesus Christ went through, Paul went through, and guess what? We endure such contradiction of sinners against ourselves. And that's why in this verse, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 3, and not only so, we don't just rejoice, we don't just glory in the fact that we're going to partake in the glory of God. We glory in tribulations. And the emphasis in that verse is that little word with two letters, in, in them. You're never going to be removed out of them. You can forget that part. 
you were not promised a primrose path of prosperity. That Joel Osteen promises that. But the word of God does not promise that. The word of God promises you that they which live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's inevitable and it has to happen. But the reason we can glory in tribulations is because of the temporary nature of them in contrast to the eternal aspect of your salvation in verses 1 and 2. That's eternal. Verse 3, that's temporal. For while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things we're not, which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Amen? All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time that we could spend in the Word of God looking at the trials of our apostle, what he went through to bring the gospel of the grace of God to us. I just pray that these words will find lodging and be forged upon the tablets of our hearts. We pray these things in the name of our Lord and our Savior,